This series is a critical commentary about an expired fundraising effort from Orbital Assembly on netcapital.com, their third in two years. This is not investment advice. The facts we present come mainly from their own pitch deck materials, as well as third-party websites, online biography pages, and SEC filings. As always, with any financial or investment decision, do your own due diligence to come to your own conclusions. Welcome back for part two of the series Orbital Disassembly 2023, where we are going to focus on this frame from their most recent pitch deck, which indicates a fair number of companies they purport are strategic partners with their organization. Taking a look at the overall frame, one might assume they've got quite a few companies on board with them already. But how many reporters or potential investors have gone through each company listed on that frame and done their homework on them and the claims of a strategic partnership with Orbital Assembly? Allow us to be the first. We are going to go through this frame one company at a time after clarifying exactly what a strategic partner is in business terms. A strategic partnership is where two or more entities pool resources, technology, and or finances to achieve mutual success, normally involving some sort of written agreement. The partnership is laid out as to what the goals of the partnership are and what each partner brings to the table. We wanted to find out directly from these companies what their deal was, so each of these companies received this email from us either to the email address on their website or through their proprietary inquiry page or both. Some companies responded right away, some didn't, and some didn't have to. We'll tell you who did give us a definite answer and what those answers were, and we'll go through the viability of the other claims based on what we could find online. If any of the companies mentioned would like to contact us to fill in any details, by all means, leave your comments below. So here we go. Right off the kick, let's get a couple easy ones out of the way. IROC Space Radio is an online radio station, also available through iHeartRadio, focusing on space news, Mars weather, and an interesting selection of music choices. IROC Space Radio has 48 followers on their Twitter account, so they're probably not going to be a very large contributor towards any fundraising or engineering effort. LifeShip is a vanity service that offers to send your DNA to the moon for $100. The promised method of delivery on their website is a Firefly Aerospace's Blue Ghost Lunar Lander, riding atop a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. Checking on the NASA website, Blue Ghost Mission 1 TO-19D intends to lift off this year, but they are no longer relying on SpaceX as their launch provider, using their own Firefly Alpha instead. That mission is designed to deliver 10 payloads to the lunar surface, but there is no mention of bringing along the life ship cargo that people have paid for. Considering LifeShip's listed address is a virtual address courtesy of the Da Vinci Group in Carlsbad, California, it's probably best not to ask too many questions or expect too much from them. Future Dude Entertainment Future Dude is Jeffrey Morris, a small-budget sci-fi filmmaker with a couple short films under his belt dating back to 2014 and 15. In 2019, he announced that an indie feature film that he wrote, called Persephone, was in pre-production with attached talent. According to IMDb, that project remains in pre-production four years later. In 2020, Morris was quoted as saying the film's budget was under $10 million, and that is simply not going to lift a production crew and actors into orbit. So very little here in the way of help towards getting a multi-billion dollar space hotel built. Dream Big World is a lifestyle brand that inspires people to follow their dreams, apparently by painting ordinary everyday things in really bright colors, akin to graffiti. DBW is the first company on the list that actually admits they have some sort of agreement with Orbital Assembly, indicating they want to put the first retail store in space, something Orbital Assembly CEO Rhonda Stevenson couldn't look happier about. Regardless of why DBW thinks a novelty store needs to be put in orbit, or what people could possibly be buying from them in space that would take up precious volume in any return capsule, it's doubtful this niche retailer would be contributing in any significant way to the cost of putting anything at all into LEO. They'll probably have more success selling their NFTs in the metaverse. Micromeat, something a guy should never have to say. As you might imagine, Micromeat is a meat alternative startup company that cultivates meat. And they have apparently come to some sort of agreement with Orbital Assembly to provide their product to the station population once it's up and running. 
This four-lady team and their advisors are intent on becoming able to cultivate proteins into fake meat from non-animal ingredients, which even on Earth is a ridiculous enterprise, requiring a laundry list of ingredients and a great deal of time and energy just to pretend to eat meat. For example, this is what goes into a Beyond Meat veggie burger, including six times the salt to make it taste better. If you want to eat pea protein isolate, bamboo cellulose, and potato starch, go nuts. Why does it have to look like a burger patty? And how are you going to fry that up in orbit? Do they have a hibachi on the ISS? At any rate, the team is led by CEO and founder of Micromeat, one Dr. Anne-Sophie Mertgen, who decided right out of her postdoctoral research gig at Tecnologico de Monterey that this was the company she wanted to start up in 2021. According to the company contact information, she's refining her not-meat cultivation process at this hacienda in San Pedro Garza Garcia, Nuevo León, Mexico. It doesn't quite taste like the real thing, does it? It's made of our shit, you know. That's the base material that we use in our replicators. We deconstruct it to the atomic level and then reform the atoms. It's pretty good for shit. If they do manage to perfect their process, they will still likely be waiting until hell freezes over to implement their systems in orbit. You'll see why as we go down this list. Space VIP. This company advertises themselves as the gateway to the cosmos, pitching space tourism with the declaration that space is for everyone. Of course, anyone that's seen the physical and psychological screening processes that astronauts endure to be considered for space missions might not agree with that statement, but it's certainly fun to think that way. Space VIP's three-person team operating out of the 47th floor of Manhattan's Paramount Plaza claim 20 years' experience designing the most unique luxury adventures on Earth for their clients. They claim to be the only company that can take you from the Mariana Trench to the International Space Station. Space VIP boasts an extensive list of working partners including SpaceX, Virgin Galactic, and Blue Origin. Oddly enough, their website didn't mention Orbital Assembly at all. So we called them and spoke with Roman Chuparuka, the fellow seated in the middle of this photo. He was a little surprised that OAC would, quote, be using Space VIP's good name to promote their own fundraising. In fact, he wanted to know where this information could be found so he could follow up on it because his organization has no agreements in place with Orbital Assembly, formal or otherwise, as confirmed in their follow-up email, which stated they haven't even spoken with each other in the past six months. Just below Space VIP, the international accounting firm Ernst & Young has their EY logo on display, although it's unlikely their accountants would have much experience in the way of building space hotels. A search of their website shows no mention of Orbital Assembly or OAC whatsoever. Also in the document that OA has provided to the SEC, Orbital Assembly used SMCPAs in White Plains, New York to provide their CPA auditor's report for the past two funding rounds, and Frucci Associates too in Spokane, Washington for their first round on net capital. We're going to go through those ones later. There's no mention of Ernst & Young in these documents anywhere. If EY is involved with OAC at all, they're probably being paid for accounting or consulting service. And sorry, but that doesn't qualify you as a strategic partner. At the bottom of the frame is another financial firm of sorts. Livingston Securities is a small investment bank which allows its namesake, Scott Livingston, the ability to call himself CEO. Their contact information on LinkedIn has them at 825 Third Avenue, New York, their website puts them at 626 Rex Court Plaza in Uniondale with a different phone number. The website seems to be two years out of date with upcoming events from 2021 featured on the main page and no press releases on that page of their site. On their transactions page, Livingston lists companies they've helped out in the past with IPOs and secondary offerings. The most recent activity was the IPO for NLS Pharmaceuticals. Here's how they're making out so far. In 2020, they did a single listed transaction for Cura Oncology. Their chart, at least, showed some promise in the middle, but not so much today. Castle Biosciences in 2019. Genosea Biosciences in 2019. Oops, the $37 million secondary offering in 2019 did nothing to bring back that flatline. Before that, it was an $85 million secondary for Mersana Therapeutics in 2019, and a $95 million secondary for Macrogenics back in 2018. Bit of a roller coaster, that one. And it's down 77% lifetime. Going back to ViewRay, because we had to swap out the chart provider, they're only down 27% lifetime. And the one growth chart in the eight most recent clients is Provention Bio Inc. They're up 139% from inception, but presently down about 30% from when their secondary offering went out. Up from last summer though, when they were trading in the $6 range, when they were down about 70% from the all-time high. 
So we know what Livingston does. They do IPOs and secondary offerings for fringe companies that on average lose 50% of their market cap very shortly afterwards. But every one of these previous eight clients was some sort of medical or biotech company. So is this who Orbital Assembly plans on going through for an IPO? Livingston had to do their own capital raise in 2020, presumably to keep their lights on, and it only raised $300,000. That doesn't go a long way if you're only doing one or two transactions a year from your New York office. Maybe they're hoping that Orbital Assembly will provide them with their big break after the company has run their course with net capital patrons. Canopus 100 Year Starship. This is a very odd inclusion because this is a writing competition for fiction and non-fiction space-related works, so not a whole lot to offer in the way of making anything happen in orbit other than maybe some new sci-fi stories. There is a distinction to be made between 100 Year Starship, which began as a one-year joint DARPA-NASA effort created to investigate the possibility of interstellar travel that was conceived in 2010, and the Canopus writing competition, which is the logo that OAC used here. The 100-Year Starship Symposia that ran from 2011 to 2015 appear to have new material to share in 2023, probably relating to that review paper that we mentioned earlier regarding artificial gravity in space. Orbital Assembly and Tim Alatori have praised this work as if they personally commissioned the paper. They even have an access portal to the paper if you provide Orbital Assembly with your contact information. We can save you the trouble and let you know it's available directly from the 100yss.org website as a download. So let's go through the website while we're here. Their partners webpage lists off the partners they have with their organization. Not surprisingly, Orbital Assembly is not listed, although the page is obviously due for an update since Nichelle Nichols is listed as a partner and Lieutenant Uhura is unfortunately no longer with us. In the bottom right, Centauri Dreams and the Tau Zero Foundation are mentioned as partners, and a couple of executives from Orbital Assembly are on the Tau Zero board. But it needs to be said that Centauri Dreams has publicly severed their relationship with Tau Zero to act as an independent forum for deep space news and ideas, for reasons they chose to not make public. Considering Centauri Dreams played a role in founding Tau Zero in 2006, it seems people should be informed why that was. However, with 100 Year Starship, nobody from Orbital Assembly appears on their advisory council either. Nowhere on this website is Orbital Assembly made mention of. And on the net capital page for Orbital Assembly in the comments section, Tim Alatori doesn't even seem to understand what this organization is, referring to it as former NASA astronaut Mae Jemison's company, 100 Year Starship. In fact, in 2011, DARPA gifted the use of the name 100 Year Starship to the Dorothy Jemison Foundation for Excellence, a nonprofit organization that also received $500,000 from DARPA to continue operations. It is not her personal company, so there's nothing to write home about here. Where to next? Well, we can clear off all the universities that Orbital Assembly claim to have partnerships with because there's two things we know for sure. Number one, universities' research is going to vary from year to year and decade to decade. So if Orbital Assembly finally gets this modular hula hoop in space by the end of 20 whenever, the schools would likely have different ideas on how to participate at that time. And number two, universities might have funds to put towards an experiment, but Orbital Assembly is nowhere near that stage yet. They're still in the I'm dreaming about building something in space stage, and schools can't help you with that. So that's going to get rid of the University of Colorado Endeavor and the University of Colorado School of Mines, University of California Irvine, Arizona State University Lightworks, ASU Proper, and the University of Central Florida. There, that clears up some space. Next up, SAM at B2. Short for Space Analog for Moon and Mars, SAM at B2 is an off-planet surface simulation facility under construction on the same site as Biosphere 2 in Oracle, Arizona, which is now operated by the University of Arizona. Once finished, SAM will be a half-acre, hermetically sealed Mars habitat analog with greenhouse, living quarters, airlock, and pressure suits. This project has support from many organizations including the University of Arizona, of course, National Geographic, and NASA has independent researchers providing data, publications, guidance, and reviews. But you may have noticed that Orbital Assembly is nowhere to be seen on this partner's page. And of course, Orbital Assembly isn't planning a Mars colony. They're talking about mini moles in orbit completely different animal. The project co-lead with Top Billing is their director of research, Kai Stutz. Kai also has a company of his own called Over the Sun, which also appears on the Strategic Partners page, which is principally engaged in the development not only of SAM, but also of SIMOC, which is a research-grade computer simulation and educational interface 
to a Mars habitat. Kai was kind enough to respond to our inquiry, informing us that Over the Sun has no legal framework in place with Orbital Assembly, further that when SAM is up and running, this university facility will be made available to any research team requiring such an off-world simulation. The university doesn't sign partnership agreements in this regard. So Orbital Assembly making this claim would be similar to you thinking you're a strategic partner with a hotel because you spent a night there, or your partners with the YMCA because you used their pool. It needs to be noted that Stotts is on the advisory committee now for Orbital Assembly, but as he indicated, neither his company nor the University of Arizona has any formal alliance with Orbital Assembly whatsoever. That's two more logos off the table. Space Link is next, hanging out here in the corner. On their website, Space Link describes themselves as an optical communications company meant for use between craft in orbit and ground stations. This diagram shows an optical communications stream between one of their ground stations to their satellite and LEO to the ISS. A strong, stable partner you can trust, according to their core value page, a wholly owned subsidiary of the Electro Optic Systems Holdings Limited, which for some reason trades on the Australian Stock Exchange. Their contact page lists two addresses for this company, the first in Northern Virginia and the second in Silicon Valley. But when we went digging, we found out the office in Northern Virginia, 8260 Greensboro Drive, Suite 503, appears to be vacant and available to rent. Quite a spacious office too, almost 6,000 square foot if you're looking. The second, even bigger space in Silicon Valley, 2465 Latham Street, Suite 110, is also vacant and available for rent according to this listing, and it's been on the market for the past three years, apparently. Turns out, Spacelink ceased operations in 2022, prior to this net capital campaign. In his misty-eyed farewell letter to his staff, the CEO, Dave Bettinger, blamed severe headwinds for space startups seeking investment thanks to the global economic environment. Things were so tough in the space startup sector that after Bettinger, his CTO Rabindra Singh, his VP of Corporate Development Edward Jerkovic, and his VP of Space Segment Lenny Lowe closed up shop at Spacelink, they co-founded another space startup in November 2022 called Axta Space Corporation, which shockingly deals with optical communication solutions for space. Long story short, the company Spacelink is out of business, so it can't be a strategic partner for OAC, and there's no mention of Axta as a strategic partner, nor does Axta even seem to have an active website connected to their LinkedIn profile. Also, it would appear that the C-suite at Spacelink were a bunch of dicks who put a group of people out of work only to start up again under a different shingle two months later. Wonder if they're running into those same economic headwinds. Moving on to Hathaway Research International. Our first Canadian company mentioned, Hathaway is an R&D lab operating out of Mississauga, Ontario a frontier scientific research and development firm employing between 11 and 50 people, according to LinkedIn. Their most recent project listed under their research heading is called AGNU, Anti-Gravity by Nuclear Entropy. Pretty deep stuff. Needless to say, highly theoretical at this point. They're also working with NIAC on measuring thrust from satellite microthrusters and with DARPA on the Confluence Electrogravitric Buoyancy Experiment. But you know who they're not working with? Orbital Assembly. These two companies can't be found on the same page or together in any article online. Valiant Space consists of two co-founders and a mechanical engineer out of Australia who have a single custom-designed valve available for sale on their website. One of these tiny valves was part of the Transporter 6 mission, so this trio and their two advisors are getting their toes in the aerospace industry door. They also appear to be developing a small thruster engine called the VS-1, although they're not keeping their 111 followers on Twitter particularly well informed. No contact information was available on the website or LinkedIn to ask what their relationship with OAC might be, but as a very young startup, probably fair to say they won't be contributing much to the billions required by Orbital Assembly in any meaningful way. GSpace says they can design and test your materials, manufacturing processes, and experiments before leaving the atmosphere using their AI-powered SAAS platform called Atom. The eight-person team listed on their website includes four PhDs and a software engineer named Ko Ming Sun, guessing they're Chinese, but they still need to upload their photo. G-Space claims funding from NASA and the National Science Foundation, with the NSF handing them a $245,000 woman-led grant in August of 2020. Their listed partners even include a couple of post-secondary schools, but again, Orbital Assembly is not listed. No announcements on their website to indicate a partnership, and a quick Google search came up with nothing indicating a cooperation is in place between the struggling orbiting space hoteliers and this NSF-funded testing lab. Kaitelian purports to be an in-space manufacturing service, according to the factoriesinspace.com website. 
their own website isn't up and running, FIS reports them as dormant, and their LinkedIn profile has almost no information other than they're located in Leesburg, Virginia, and have between 2 and 10 employees. If not for these sparsely detailed profiles, it would be difficult to find them anywhere online at all. There's seriously more information available about how the logo designer put their package together. Check out Elena Gray Tibbetts. She does good work. Hope she got paid. After some digging around on Rocket Reach, we did find one person with past connections to Kytelian. His name is Anthony Matthews, but he's over 65 now, so he's probably retired. And his Twitter account, with no followers, that follows nobody, seems to be as well. So we kept digging and finally found their business address and phone number on BuzzFile, along with the name Christian Tibbetts. He's the president of this now company of one, founded in 2020, whose business address in Leesburg is this house. Nothing to see here, not even what they used to do, if they ever did anything at all. Cislunar Industries. This company aspires to be an on-orbit recycler of materials, stating they're looking to smelt metals in space and on other worlds. Their vision is to recycle space junk into usable materials while on orbit, as shown in their presentation slide. Lofty ambitions for an eight-person crew currently operating out of the Park co-working offices in Denver, Colorado, but they seem to be making progress with a successful zero-g parabolic flight test last November. Cislunar did a live demonstration in October of 2021 at the Colorado School of Mining, and a video on their YouTube channel with 18 followers shows a heated copper coil slag a piece of unidentified metal in a crucible that hangs down the center. In September of 2022, Cislunar and Orbital Assembly did have a formal agreement signing at IAC 2022 in Paris, where Orbital Assembly agreed to provide Cislunar with on-orbit facilities in exchange for construction and manufacturing materials coming back to OAC. The signatory to the agreement was Shauna Pandaya, who is an advisor for, but not an officer of, the company. Forgive us for pointing out the obvious, but wouldn't that arrangement again depend entirely upon OAC being able to make good on their promise to create a facility in orbit? Now, as it turns out, the US Space Force just awarded a $1.7 million Phase 2 SBIR contract to Cislunar Industries and their partners. Which partners would those be? Astroscale and Colorado State University, with no mention of Orbital Assembly again. How Industries Another small business that seems to be funded with a million dollar grant, LinkedIn states how is a small organization operating out of a warehouse in Bahia Business Park in Scottsdale, Arizona. Their website links to a net capital funding round for a breakaway company to raise funds to develop and produce their Thermosat, an experimental solar-powered steam thruster for CubeSats. To date, they raised about $30,000 of the million they wanted to raise, mainly so that they can draw a paycheck and pay rent since compensation for managers and lab space office rent top their use chart for these funds. The remaining funds, if there were any left over, would go towards putting these units into testing and production. Their CPA review report, dated August 16th of 2022, attached to the net capital profile, contains some interesting information, including the present state of the finances where this company on June 30th of 2022 had less than $3,500 to its name on page three, but was in the black thanks to a $7,000 loan issued by a related party. And on page 5, Note B declares management's uncertainty about the ability of the company to continue as a going concern, something they have in common with Orbital Assembly. Since these Thermosat CGI units don't appear to be in real-world production, and since Thermosat Inc. are currently conducting their own poorly received fundraising drive to cover their bills, even if they have a partnership in place with OAC, it would obviously not amount to much. Let's do Electric Sky next, and there's a couple tangents going to be thrown in here. Electric Sky claimed to be pioneering movement under external power, making transportation more swift, sustainable, and economical. You gotta love that word salad. They were a three-person company with their camera guy operating out of Midland, Texas, according to Crunchbase. And it just so happens their CTO, Jeff Greeson, is on the advisory panel for Orbital Assembly. So, congratulations, they managed to convince their own advisor to come on board as a strategic partner. After Jeff spent 16 years with XCOR Aerospace. XCOR was an American private spaceflight and rocket engine development company that never actually did any private spaceflights. They went bankrupt in 2017, leaving their prepaid customers high and dry on their $100,000 deposits that they put down to take a suborbital flight with XCOR. In December of 2021, Electric Sky made the news by claiming a DARPA Phase 1 SBIR grant of $225,000 to develop a way of recharging drones while they're in flight using whisper beam transmitters. 
No word on a successful experiment, nor test, nor a Phase 2 grant in the works. After watching x crash and burn, Greeson went into business for himself, starting up Greeson Space LLC, which he still runs from his house in Midland, Texas, according to OpenCorporates.com. Despite having what appears to be a reasonable resume and somehow being considered an expert in reusable launch vehicle regulations, Greeson is now involved with Orbital Assembly and with a couple other organizations whose names come up for which there is very little information. The first is the Kepler Space Institute, described as a small private research university in Florida, which operates out of a second-story suite just down the hall from Wagner Real Estate's corporate office in the Wildwood Professional Park at 3639 Cortez Road in Bradenton, Florida. Kepler has a Twitter account that's garnered 200 followers since 2014. The profile mainly seems to retweet current space news. No photos of students or class photos or curriculum or anything school-related. According to LinkedIn, their single listed alumnus lives in Rwanda. They're apparently licensed by the Florida Commission for Independent Education, the same branch of the Department of Education that also hands out licenses for massage colleges and beauty schools. Nobody we've talked to seems to know much about this particular school, so we went looking into the five people listed as their leadership team, starting with Harun Okab, the listed president whose name pops up on searches, along with the VP of Finance and Administration, Nate Sushiraba. Seems that in August of 2017, these two tried to open up a company called Enterprise in Space Education Partners, LLC, out of an office in this little plaza in Tallahassee, Florida. Ten months later, they shut it down. Fortunately, around the same time they filed incorporation papers for this failed enterprise, Haroon landed himself a director position at Kepler, where he has since become CEO, and his partner, Nate, landed herself the VP gig. Except, according to her LinkedIn, she's been at Kepler since 2012, the only job posting on her incomplete profile. So this pair have been working together for a while now. As for the other names on the frame, Dr. Fred Gaines does not recognize his participation with Kepler on his LinkedIn profile, but he does list his current employment as Executive Director of the Brooksville Agricultural and Environmental Research Station Program of the Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University, a position he's now held for five years. Kat Crone also makes no mention of Kepler on her LinkedIn profile, and she's apparently based out of Burbank, California, as VP of Labor Relations at the Team Companies LLC, a company she's worked for since 1995. The oddest man out here is the board chair, Edward Kiker. His LinkedIn profile declares he has been the chief scientist with the Kepler Space Institute since their days as the Kepler Space University, dating back to 2005. He says he, along with Dr. Richard Kirby, founded that university, but there's almost no information about that school available. And if he's the chief scientist, what papers has he published? Several friends of the channel conducted searches for us to try and track down his scientific accomplishments, only to find nothing. And since when is chief scientist a faculty position at an institution of higher learning? We did find an old profile on Zoom Info for Kepler Space University, the Facebook link on it doesn't work, the website doesn't exist, and according to Google Earth, the headquarters reported address was a cramped little mailbox in the UPS store located at 198 Okatee Village Drive, Bluffton, South Carolina. Not unlike the original address for John Blankhouse Gateway Foundation in California. Kiker's profile says he's a Harvard grad with a four-year Bachelor of Arts, graduated in 1970. He spent 1987 to 2014 with the Department of the Army as a civilian, during which he founded his P.O. Box University. And it says on here that Kiker lives in Madison, Alabama, about 400 miles or 640 kilometers away from the Tallahassee campus. So, to be honest, we've got no idea what to make of this guy, or the other directors, or the school. Crunchbase shows them as active, with the only contact and employee on their profile being Jeff Greeson. Other than the website that will happily take your $24,000 in tuition fees, there seems to be no legitimate mention of this place anywhere. If someone watching knows anyone who went there, graduated from there, taught there, or knows anything about Kepler Space Institute at all, please leave some information in the comments below. And if you see any of these trademarks pop up anywhere, same thing. These are all the other company names and trademarks that the Kepler Space Institute is trying to acquire. The other organization that Greeson is involved with is the Tau Zero Foundation, where he's chair of the board of this completely outdated nonprofit website seeking your donations. Last entries on their page are from 2019. 
Greeson chairs the Tau Zero board, where Rhonda Stevenson, CEO of Orbital Assembly, now has the dual role at Tau Zero of President and CEO. This is where we told you we were going to circle back to her. The Tau Zero Foundation's name pops up on occasion. You'll remember we brought them up during this segment on the 100-year Starship. On their website, the Tau Zero Foundation refer to themselves as a coalition of researchers, educators, makers, and visionaries who pioneer bridge-building methods, develop solutions, and inspire us all towards interstellar flight. In 2017, NASA lined up a half-million-dollar grant for Tau Zero to produce a three-year study titled Interstellar Propulsion Review. We've already gone through the difference between a review paper and a research paper. We were able to find a single paper published in 2018 from what was supposed to be a three-year study. According to a good friend of the channel, the work they produced was unimpressive. If you follow us on Twitter, you might remember a fellow that went by the username Rocket Racer. The guy eats rocket and space-related technical papers like candy. His opinion is that most of the material was recycled from other publications that he could name and that NASA overpaid for the work by about $400,000. The three names on this report were Rhonda Stevenson, Jeff Greeson, and Mark G. Millis. Millis, at the time, was head of Tau Zero. In 2017, Tau Zero received $154,540. We're assuming that was a one-third payment of the grant money for the three-year study. Of the three names on the report, only two people got paid. Millis pocketed $77,826, and Rhonda Stevenson banked $32,325. Jeff Greeson didn't get paid one thin dime, according to this ProPublica filing based on IRS records. Judging from the information available between the IRS site and ProPublica, Tau Zero, generally speaking, made less than $50,000 per year, which allowed them to file these postcards with the IRS, the most recent being done in 2020. There is no link to their 2018 and 2019 tax returns, so we can't say what happened during those years or if they got paid for producing two more years of that report. But what we can tell you is that in 2020, according to the filings, this organization was being run out of Rhonda Stevenson's house in Broomfield, Colorado. And this coalition of geniuses, led now by Greeson and Stevenson, made less than $50,000 in that fiscal year. Which leaves one more thread to follow before we get back to the main story. This is the Tau Zero website, as it comes up today. This is their donations page where you can give them a one-time donation or pay for a monthly subscription. This is Jeff Greeson's current biography as the board chairman. This is Rhonda Stevenson's current biography as the president and chief executive officer. And this is the opencorporates.com filing for Tau Zero, where Mark Millis canceled Tau Zero Foundation Incorporated on January 13th of 2021, over two years ago. So this will conclude the Jeff Greeson, Rhonda Stevenson fringe organization involvement tangent for now. ILC Dover is the undisputed leader in spacesuit technology, having provided suits for 250 space flights, the six moon landings, and 3,000 hours of spacewalks. If you're looking for spacesuits, these are your guys. They also provide solutions for spacecraft landing systems, inflatable space habitats, and lighter than aircraft. For spacesuits, they offer three different types, two of which would be needed by people working on board an orbiting space station. The first is called a SOL, their Launch Entry and Abort Suit, or LEA. It's what people would be wearing getting to and returning from the station in the case of an abort scenario, pretty much the space equivalent of a life jacket. The second type of space crew would require would be the Astro, ILC's EVA suit. These are the serious suits for astronauts working in space, including walking on a planet's surface. They deal properly with the extreme temperatures and vacuum of space. The third kind of suit ILC has created is the planetary exploration suit. But as we said, space stations don't necessarily need this suit. And from what we could find, they've never mentioned orbital assembly at all. Just because these are your go-to guys, doesn't mean they are your strategic partner. Compare the relative pennies that Orbital Assembly has collected in their latest fundraising effort to the billions of dollars taken in for the development of these suits. Doesn't take a math whiz to know Orbital Assembly is in no position to become a major client of ILC Dover. Morpheus Space is a team of innovators, engineers, and entrepreneurs that aim to accelerate the growth of the space industry. And to do that, they're working on nano thrusters for satellites that weigh a third of a pound and use a proprietary non-toxic alloy as fuel in a system that doesn't require valves, actuators, large tanks, pipes, or expensive propellants. Sounds intriguing. Their seed investors thought so as well and provided Morpheus another $28 million in fundraising for their Series A round. Not listed here is Orbital Assembly. In fact, Orbital Assembly is not listed anywhere on their site 
or found alongside Morpheus in any press release anywhere. Just to be sure, we wrote away to Morpheus to see if they have any arrangements in place with Orbital Assembly, and they responded to our inquiry by letting us know that they were not aware their logo or company was being used in Orbital Assembly's pitch deck as a strategic partner. The symbol right beside Morpheus, that looks very similar to the NASA Apollo mission patches, is Astroscale US, an extension of the Singapore-based parent company founded by Japanese businessman Nobu Okada in 2013. Their company goal is to clean up all the trash in orbit around Earth, and we heard their name before attached to Cislunar Industries. In September of 2021, Rocket Lab announced that they had been awarded the launch contract for a 2023 demonstration mission of the Astroscale Address J satellites using their Electron rocket. This was commissioned by JAXA for Phase 1 of their commercial removal of debris demonstration project. This demonstration intends to rendezvous with a long-abandoned upper-stage rocket body. A planned second phase would then attempt to deorbit the debris. Astroscale is a serious company, receiving serious funding to come up with this orbital garbage removal technology, as well as the other services Astroscale intends to provide in orbit. LinkedIn puts their operational headquarters in Sumida, Japan, with a headcount between 200 and 500 employees, 284 of which are on LinkedIn. Astroscale and Orbital Assembly, however, share no common article mentions that Google can find during online searches. A search of Orbital Assembly on the Astroscale website confirms they have not been mentioned at all. Since Astroscale intends to launch aboard Rocket Lab vehicles, let's do them next, since they are also on the strategic partners frame. Rocket Lab is a launch provider based out of New Zealand that uses launch facilities at Wallops Island, Virginia and Mahia, New Zealand. Let's just get this out of the way. Neither Orbital Assembly nor Rocket Lab have ever released a presser indicating they have any working relationship whatsoever, nor has any media outlet associated the two companies outside of press releases. With that out of the way, let's tell you about the two rockets in the Rocket Lab arsenal. First up is their Electron, advertised as the only reusable small launch vehicle with 33 launches to date and 155 satellites successfully deployed. This baby girl was literally what got Rocket Lab off the ground and able to progress to their next platform. This is Neutron, a much larger rocket platform looking at delivering 8 to 13 tons of payload to LEO. Neutron was introduced to the public by Rocket Lab's founder, president, and CEO, Peter Beck, with Beck literally eating his hat, because that's what he promised to do if Rocket Lab ever developed a larger rocket. AFRL is the research lab for both the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Space Force. One AFRL, two services. And as it turns out, while we were finishing up this segment, Orbital Assembly announced that the U.S. Space Force decided to throw them a lifeline, which, in light of another government-issued report we're going to cover later, was a little surprising. At this time, there is not a corresponding notice of the award on the AFRL website. According to this press release on the Orbital Assembly website, the U.S. Space Force has given Orbital Assembly a $1.7 million direct-to-phase-2 grant to develop rapidly deployable on-orbit structural technologies to support many types of electronic equipment. Let's just make a couple of quick points on this grant. Number one is for a proof of concept only for truss assembly technology that they have been unable to demonstrate to date. Their 2021 demo was mainly done using manual labor, and they've already done this, which means the next presentation they do will have to actually be autonomous. Number two, the $1.7 million grant is not far off the present annual burn rate at Orbital Assembly, so that gives them a little over a year to prove to the government they've got the goods before they run out of money again. And number three, this is the same branch of the armed forces that gave Musk $102 million because they thought this looked like a good idea two years ago. Obviously, taxpayers' money well spent. Bradford Space was founded in 1984 and has participated in 146 rocket launches, putting 2,149 of their products into orbit. These products fall into four different categories, propulsion, attitude controls, deep space avionics, and astronaut workstations, but their jam is propulsion, as they say on their LinkedIn profile, as they are one of the world's largest builders of space propulsion systems. Here's a sampling of what they provided for various machines and missions. Falcon 9s, Ariane 5, Atlas 5, even Electron and Soyuz vehicles are represented. So it would make sense that a company such as Orbital Assembly with aspirations in space would be interested in acquiring some of this tech for the rotating mini mall. Let's see if Bradford has entered into any agreements with Orbital Assembly. Nope, can't see a single instance where Orbital Assembly or OAC is mentioned in any article or on any website alongside Bradford. 
no partnership announcements, and Google can't find Orbital Assembly or OAC anywhere on the Bradford Space website. Space Information Laboratories Another one of the more legitimate names on the list, despite them being a smaller business with under 50 employees, they show on their website where they have provided equipment for the Atlas V and the International Space Station, equipment such as lithium-ion battery packs, and they have recently received a $7 million subcontract from Lockheed Martin, along with several SBIR contracts from the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Space Force prior to 2022. And SIL makes it pretty obvious who their partners are on this page of their website. Aerojet Rocketdyne, one of the longest standing contractors of the aerospace industries, founded in 1942 with a current staff of 5,000 people, headquartered in Sacramento, California. Their area of expertise is, you guessed it, propulsion. Actually, their website is rocket.com. The AR Holding Company celebrated their 100th birthday in 2015, and the propulsion arm has been supplying propulsion systems for military, civil, and commercial needs in the aerospace and defense industry markets for decades. Their client list includes the DoD, NASA, ULA, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, and Raytheon. It was their RS-25 rocket engines that powered SLS's Artemis One mission. These are the guys. Aerojet is a nearly $5 billion partner for all the major players in the space industry, and Orbital Assembly is by no means a major player, which explains why there is no mention of Orbital Assembly and Aerojet Rocketdyne together in any sentence anywhere. Paragon Space Development Corporation is another established player in the space arena. Founded in 1993 with their headquarters in Tucson, Arizona, they employ over 200 people across three locations, producing life support systems and thermal control products, and also offering engineering services and precision manufacturing. In June of 2022, Paragon announced that NASA awarded a $3.5 billion contract to their partnership with the Axiom Space Team. The Exploration Extravehicular Activity Services contract is a 10-year obligation to develop the next-generation spacesuit which may be used for Artemis missions to the Moon and the ISS. Paragon's contribution to this collaboration will be the life support and thermal controls on these suits. So needless to say, Paragon is going to have their hands full. The other contract went to Collins Aerospace, who are partners with ILC Dover, who we covered earlier. Paragon CEO Grant Anderson did an interview with Jeff Greenblatt from Orbital Assembly with his channel on 30-some subscribers, and this is how Jeff described their business relationship. Clearly what you provide to any uh, space-based activity is is truly critical when it comes to having humans on board, and we're excited to be uh, working with you. Uh, We hope to partner with you as a provider of our life support systems when we uh, uh, launch our first commercial space station in a couple years time. Hoping to partner with you someday does not make you a strategic partner. Rogue Space Systems Corporation is a small shop founded in 2020 based out of Laconia, New Hampshire, where according to LinkedIn they have a couple dozen people working on engineering and performing satellite services in LEO and GEO orbits. According to these CGI profile pics, they also seem to be developing a couple of types of orbital robots or orbots is their registered trademark. The LoRa Orbot function is to inspect, monitor, and observe other objects while in orbit, using a variety of high-definition cameras and sensors. Now, if you've followed Orbital Assembly's prior fundraising drives, you'll remember their own lineup of drones at the heart of their very first crowdfunding effort. The first one, for which Orbital Assembly did a Kickstarter campaign that failed, was the Observer Drone, due to be developed by 2021 according to their previous pitch deck on Net Capital. This year, 2023, the errant object retrieval drones were supposed to be good to go. This was the entire premise of their first 2021 Net Capital funding round that raised close to a million dollars. Today, those devices are nowhere to be found on the Orbital Assembly funding presentation, nor on their website. So what happened to the development of these drones, since that's where the money was supposed to be going? Well, let's compare the dates on these events. The first Orbital Assembly funding round ran from January 27th to April 22nd of 2021. Two months after that round closed, before their next funding round, Orbital Assembly committed in June of 2021 to leasing two LoRa drones from Rogue. That's not how the raised funds were supposed to be spent. Developing the Observer drones in-house, as proposed, would have given the company a real-world IP, something the investors could benefit from. But instead, they spent money on two devices that they won't even own. So this would be like asking your parents to give you the down payment for a house, but then turning around and renting a condo with the money instead. The money is not going towards ownership. Anyway, Rogue apparently has a letter of intent in place with Orbital Assembly to lease them two LoRa drones. There's a couple obvious things about this that really need to be stated. First is that the LoRa, even if they get it working as designed, 
serve no productive purpose. They can only observe something else in space using their onboard sensors. Laura can't build or move anything. Rogue's FRED unit is the one that they say will capture and transport objects between orbits, such as the construction pod orbital assembly was supposed to have ready by 2024, but they no longer mention at all. Rogue did their own crowdfunding on TrueCrowd in August of 2021 that raised $90,000 towards developing their trio of drones, which at the time were promised in 2022 and 2023. Now they're being promised in 2023 and 2024, and they're rethinking the name Charlie. Seldor Capital apparently threw half a million dollars in their direction as the only investor in a seed funding round in December of 2021. They got another $2.8 million in May of 2022 from the Spaceworks Orbital Prime Initiative, which is a push for new technology from the U.S. Space Force. Rogue is planning on launching a LoRa demo mission at some point this year through that program. Now the LoRa, to be clear, is a 12U CubeSat. That means it measures about 20 by 20 by 34 centimeters, roughly 8 by 8 by 12 inches smaller than a milk crate. Assuming everything works perfectly and Orbital Assembly lives up to their end of the agreement, they'll be leasing two CubeSat camera units to float around in orbit. What they'll be observing is yet to be seen. Down to the final three, and these are the big ones, starting with Sierra Space. Sierra Space has always figured prominently in Orbital Assembly Space Station vaporware fundraising attempts. Their Dream Chaser has appeared in every Voyager animation that Orbital Assembly ever produced with the intention of fundraising. Their pitch deck from their 2021 net capital round featured 44 of these units mounted in pairs around the outside of the Voyager space station in the same photo that is being used in their current pitch deck, originally seen in the articles written in 2019 about the Gateway Foundation's Von Braun station. Same photo. And in all their recycled CGI's, nobody's bothered to fix the way these things are mounted to the exterior. Think about how artificial gravity in a rotating station is going to act on people trying to board these things through a hatch in the rear. It's going to send them straight through the windshield like a wiffle ball. Now the Dream Chaser is also in their newest, much smaller aspirational CGI for Pioneer. Well, more accurately, there's four of them in this photo. These guys like mounting these units in pairs. So if you look carefully, you can see two of them facing forwards and two mounted below them upside down. The Dream Chaser is a 9 meter space plane being developed by Sierra Space in Nevada that seats seven people. The origins go back to a 2004 announcement made by the original company, SpaceDev, that was acquired by Sierra Nevada Corporation in 2008. Prior to this acquisition, SpaceDev had two key agreements in place, with ULA in September of 2007 to use their Atlas V rocket to deliver their Dream Chaser into orbit, and they had signed a Space Act agreement with NASA in June of 2007. SNC bought out SpaceDev for $38 million in October of 2008. So this design has been in the works for almost 20 years and may finally be ready to launch later this year. ULA is still their intended launch partner, but they are hoping to use the Vulcan Centaur to launch the very first Dream Chaser into orbit, which has been dubbed Tenacity. Using the Vulcan Centaur instead of the Atlas V will result in a lowered cost per launch, and right now the very first Vulcan Centaur is getting readied at Cape Canaveral for their inaugural launch with their Peregrine payload for astrobotic technology. Now on top of developing the Dream Chaser program, Sierra Space has also partnered up with Blue Origin to develop Orbital Reef, which NASA accepted in 2021 as a suitable project for the development of commercial space stations. In other words, Sierra already has a space station project they're working on and a partner they're working with. But let's pretend they didn't. Let's pretend what Orbital Assembly is showing in their presentation materials represents a strategic partnership between Orbital Assembly and Sierra Space. There are four Dream Chasers mounted on each Pioneer station. Each one of those planes cost $100 million minimum to launch aboard a Vulcan Centaur rocket. That's $400 million in launch cost alone, not counting the cost of each plane. The cost per unit for a Dream Chaser is not nailed down anywhere, but we're going to use $100 million per plane as a round number, which is probably way light considering the billions that have gone into developing the vehicle over time. That means just to have four Dream Chasers mounted around the outside of Pioneer to use as life rafts, Orbital Assembly would have to cough up $800 million. Remind us again where they are in their fundraising effort. A collaboration announcement between Orbital Assembly and Sierra Space cannot be found on Google, and the news page on our own website does not mention Orbital Assembly at all. Since we've already covered ULA as being the launch provider for the Dream Chasers OAC cannot afford, let's just note that nowhere online is there any mention of ULA and Orbital Assembly having any sort of agreement in place to launch anything into orbit on their behalf. 
not their dream chasers, not their habitats, and not their P-Star assembly system. And a search of ULA's own website shows that United Launch Alliance have not ever made mention of Orbital Assembly in any of their online articles. Which brings us to the final name on the board, and we've saved the biggest and best for last. NASA. Yep, that NASA. OAC claims to have a strategic partnership in place with the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, which might be news to NASA, who make a habit of announcing every partnership they make, no matter how stupid. In fact, recent announcements from NASA would indicate the exact opposite is true, since NASA flat out rejected an orbital assembly proposal in 2021. Orbital assembly submission for the commercial space station design was rejected in 2021 as a possible contender for replacing the ISS. Maverick Space and Think Orbital propositions also got tossed in favor of concepts from Blue Origin, NanoRacks, and Northrop Grumman. Also rejected were proposals from SpaceX and Relativity Space. In fact, here's exactly what NASA had to say about the OAC concept, using this color chart to evaluate the various aspects of what they submitted. The technical evaluation received a score of red, the lowest possible score. That's even considering NASA was under the impression that the gravity ring and peace star device that were not mentioned in the third funding round at all were launching later this year, and NASA chalked that up as their only significant strength. Other non-significant strengths mentioned were a promised crew of more than two people, modularity, which was probably a common denominator across most, if not all, submissions, a design that provided capacity for large payloads, an artificial gravity proposal that includes external payloads, another reference to crew as on-site maintenance workers, and a strong emergency response and redundancy plan which likely comes from attaching dream chasers to half of the docking ports. In the significant weakness category, they got torn down. A lack of understanding of complexities of resupply, not addressing space environment challenges, lack of availability for sun-synchronous orbit as required, requiring use of NASA heritage hardware, including the ISS ECLS unit, and the fact that their proposed long-duration artificial gravity concept is incompatible with some research. Limited development description, weak risk strategy, and a complex assembly proposal wrap up their significant weaknesses. The regular weakness list included a lack of controllability assessment for the artificial gravity design, and an unidentified avionics and command and data handling design and risk assessment. We read this as NASA saying they don't believe Orbital Assembly has the equipment nor the ability to control a rotating space station. Would you agree with that interpretation? For the business plan evaluation, NASA did not find one single strength, significant or otherwise, in what they were given to review, resulting in another lowest possible score of red. Their significant weaknesses, on the other hand? Well, Failure to provide a customer-based business strategy. A proposed management team that has no experience in funding and developing a large-scale human space system. That's kind of a big one. Seeking more funds from NASA than its cost during the SAA, Space Act Agreement. Seeking massive financing without presenting a viable business plan. Seeking massive revenue without presenting a viable marketing plan. Proposing its CDR, Critical Design Review, occur before its PDR, Preliminary Design Review and failure to meet requirements of the announcement regarding major suppliers, which, to us, would indicate a lack of suitable strategic partners. And their other weaknesses, lack of a clear plan for an early demonstration mission, and schedule risk due to the need to acquire funds before acquiring development resources. In short, these two red scores result in a complete fail. But Orbital Assembly would have people believe that NASA has now come on board as their strategic partner. The completely red report card is one thing, but what's even more amusing is how Rhonda Stevenson tried to spin the result to the media the same day it was released. Orbital Assembly Corporation recognized by NASA's commercial LEO development program. Well, they were recognized, all right. Stevenson did not mention the failing grades at all, and she cherry-picked the one paragraph that outlined a couple of points that, really, every other proposal would have included, such as crew count and modularity. Kind of hard to run a space station with no people aboard, and almost impossible to launch an entire space station in one piece. A couple weeks prior to receiving this failing report card, Orbital Assembly opened their second round of funding on net capital not by showing the Pioneer Station images that they had submitted to NASA, but by once again featuring the Voyager Station left over from the Recycled Gateway Foundation section of CGI's. Even on their own website announcement for round two, it's Voyager, not Pioneer, being used to generate excitement. And still, the title frame does not represent the station mentioned in the development timeline. Now, knowing full well that OAC had just completely failed the NASA adjudication process, 
Tim Alatori still went on their YouTube channel and repeated most of the highlights in the article that Stevenson incompletely quoted. You know, we highlighted a couple of the, the things that they had stated regarding our proposal on the on the positive side. We had a flight demonstration of automated on orbit assembly of trust, more than two crew members at initial operations. They also liked our modularity. They liked that we were able to provide the capacity for larger payloads, potential for artificial gravity, the potential for external payloads, that we had crew on station for maintenance, impressed by our strong emergency response. Then Tim went into a weakness that NASA identified, and he shifted blame here. He said NASA misunderstood the portion where they described their docking procedure. Here's what he said. First off, uh, one, one of the negatives, I think, was a misreading of our proposal. They were asking how would we dock to uh, the station in rotation, and that was not something we were planning on doing. Uh, the, the station is to be despun, and, and docking would occur in a, in a non-rotating uh, position. And this brings up another fantastic point, which we have brought up before, that demonstrates exactly why we don't think any serious thought has been put into this at all. When this hoop is spinning, you can't dock to it. It's just not possible. Imagine a playground merry-go-round. Docking a Dream Chaser to Pioneer Station would be like trying to jump backwards onto this while it's in motion, requiring you to run backwards and sideways and in a circle to match the speed of the station before trying to jump in between the bars. So what's Alatori's solution? De-spin the station for docking. First, the energy required to spin the structure up or down would be enormous, and it would not happen on a moment's notice. Second, as a proposed gravity station, you'll be losing gravity when the station de-spins. So as items on board become weightless, they're going to start floating and smacking into walls as the capsules decelerate. Any system requiring gravity to function, thinking water systems and black water plumbing and storage tanks, would cease to function. Then after the craft is docked, the station will need to be spun up again. Now with a completely different weight distribution, and everything floating around on the capsules would now be thrown towards either the wall in the direction of the spin or fall to the floor. The fresh gray and black water tanks would need to settle around, and if the wheel is perfectly balanced again, you might be able to get it spinning without a wobble. That is not likely. And just to show you that is how it works in real life, here's the effect on personnel and materials aboard the ISS when the station is boosted back into its proper orbit. When the ISS starts moving, anything not tied down moves freely around the cabin according to which way the ship is accelerating. Now as for the balance statement, take a look at this docking scenario, which would play out every time a ship left the station. On the left is a Pioneer station with full docking bays with identical ships set across from each other. The rotational axis of the station is in the center of the void. The station de-spins and launches a Dream Chaser. Now the station is completely unbalanced. The axis has changed because the weight distribution has changed. The further away from the rotational axis that this change occurs, the more of an imbalance problem that will be. Which demonstrates an opinion we've held about these station concepts and any artificial gravity paradigm that requires rotation. Unless the system remains completely and perfectly balanced, it will wobble. If it wobbles, that's a problem. And right now, nobody can possibly know for sure how big of a problem that is going to be. In this case, the issue isn't even the station design. It's the application of rotational gravity that will throw it for a loop. So we've gone through their entire partners list, one company at a time. If there was one name you expected to see on there that wasn't, what would it have been? Take a look at this frame, and what do you see? Right here. That's a SpaceX Starship. Up until now, the claims made by Starship regarding payload and cost per launch has been a linchpin as a throwaway counterpoint for obvious issues regarding the amount of material OAC would have to lift to orbit. This video demonstrates how OAC intended for Starship to dock at Voyager Station. The hardshell habitats they're supposedly building would have to use Starship to get into orbit given their size. So why now is there absolutely no mention of SpaceX or Starship in their net capital pitch deck? Not under strategic partners and not in their orbital ecosystem frame as resupply and staging provider. What changed? Did SpaceX tell them to stop using their vaporware to raise funds? Or is it possible the faith in Starship is so low already that even companies desperate to raise money have finally realized there's nothing there. While we're on this frame, let's make note of a couple other companies they have listed here. Spin Launch, Hypersciences, Intuitive Machines, Stoke, and Virgin Orbit are five new companies that appear on this frame, but are not mentioned anywhere else in this presentation as any type of strategic partner. Not to mention, Virgin Orbit is going through some financial difficulty right now. That's going to wrap up their pitch deck presentation. 
And in part three, we are going to go through their net capital page and their SEC filings with a fine tooth comb to see what else we can find out about this company.